As a family, it's pretty great. Great week, too. Uh, for those of you who uh, made it to Christopher Robbins, which um, basically was none of you. I'm just going to tell you right now. It was it was Chelsea and I, Don and Sharon, and Don's family, okay? And so I'm just telling you right now, if ever you're like, yeah, that was a great movie. You didn't see it with us, okay? But I am hope you enjoyed the movie. Uh, I know some movie nights work out on different nights. We always try and pick a Tuesday night because then it's the cheaper movies. But <clears throat> keep an eye out. We will let you know at the next uh, family movie night. Hopefully, you can make it. We had a good time there. I really had a good time. I loved it. And, um, I, I, you know, I, 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 just, I just made a judgment on the movie, right? I said I love the movie. And if you look at your bulletin today, you'll notice that the title is kind of ominous. It says Judgment. Judgment, right? And some of you are like, probably saw that and you're like, oh, maybe I need to leave right now. Like, this is not good for me to be here if I'm going to receive judgment. And if we're going to do it right, we should do it like this and say, this Sunday, 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 judgment at new beginnings. Like, that's the kind of thing. When you think of judgment, it's usually not exciting unless you try and hide it up like that, but that's because we live in a pretty judgmental society. We really do. We make judgments all the time. I know I do, and, and I was actually a little surprised at a news story this week. I shouldn't have been surprised at all, but I, I want to show you if we can we'll drag it over a, a clip, a photo from Instagram, and this kind of ties along with the, the, the WWF style announcing of Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I don't know if you can see that, but in this photo here, and on either what screen you're looking at there, you've got down here, you've got a, a bald guy reaching out, and he's like high-fiving, I think it's a beluga whale or something like that. That, right? And that is The Rock. If you know the actor The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, he's in tons of movies. He's a really funny guy. He's, an, he's a really interesting guy. His Instagram account, I don't know if you can see there, he has 112 million followers on his Instagram account. This particular photo he put up of taking his family to the aquarium for that day, this particular one had 5,460,000 likes. That means 5 million people clicked, I like this, including me. And and, uh, and, and what's really neat about that is the reason I heard about this story is because there's a handful of people who weren't happy with this photo. <laughs> they were not happy with The Rock because they felt that he was condoning the imprisonment of animals that should be in their natural wild habitat. And that's why I heard this story is because it became this big thing where a bunch of people judged him and really put him under judgment for taking his family to the aquarium and having a great day and him sharing photos of it. And, and it's really interesting to me because there's a, t a group of people upset at him. Now, it's not that big a group of people because there's... 5.5 million people who like this alone, <laughs> and I'm willing to guess it's probably less than 10,000 who were upset about it. But in our society, we're pretty used to that. And celebrities especially are used to always being judged for every single little action they do. And this week, if you were following along with us in the year of the Bible, and you can see how that bookmarker keeps getting closer and closer down, and by the end of the year, we're going to be all the way through it. We read a lot about judgment. There was a lot of things about judgment. And judgment, let me just say this. We're not going to talk about this part a lot, but judgment is a real thing. And here's something you need to know. There's going to be a real judgment on the real last day, and it's going to be by the real God. Now, aside from that, we're going to talk about some other things we saw this week because judgment's a pretty popular thing that I think it comes out that we have a fear of. I mean, I think everybody's a little nervous about that last day, really want the big thumbs up from Jesus and not the thumbs down, right? But we tend to get a little upset or a little worried or fear of judgment just in society overall and what people will think and different things like that. And so there's some, some verses that came out that kind of leapt to, the, leapt to the surface. They jumped up to the surface this week that really kind of showed how we have a fear of judgment, but what really we should have a fear of judgment is only on that last day, and really we should talk about why or if we should even have a fear. So let me just say this. If we're going to have a fear of judgment, then our fear should be rooted in truth. That's the take home for us today. If we're going to have a fear of judgment, our fear of judgment should be rooted in truth. And so we're going to look at a couple of untruths, or lies we call them, that kind of became exposed in the reading this week. Starting right off the top is this one here. Before we even get into God's judgment, we should not fear man's judgment. Very first thing is we should not fear man's judgment. And you'll notice there's a dot, dot, dot. And we're going to complete that sentence a little on, but we're going to explore this concept of, of not fearing man's judgment first. And I just talked about the rock and about the judgment he faced just for going out with his, his family to the aquarium. And why do we give so much power to other people and what they think all the time? 
Now, The Rock, I don't, to my knowledge, he hasn't apologized for his family vacation. Maybe he looked at the numbers of how many people like it versus don't. Maybe he waited out. Maybe he doesn't care. I don't know. But typically, we put big credibility into what other people think and how they judge. That's why I heard that story about that news thing is because it was in the newspaper because so many people made a stink about it. And I wonder if it's, we put so much credibility into what other people think, maybe as a church, because one of the passages we read this week. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 8. And there were some really interesting passages we looked at this week. Couldn't cover them all, just so you know. But if you read along, you, you, you read some stuff that was really transparent by Paul in his writings to the Corinthian church. <clears throat> but check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 says this. When one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you're going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have legal disputes about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I am saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in, in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Whoa. Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. And like, wow, Paul's coming out swinging to the church here. He says he's, he's saying this to shame them. He's not saying like, hey, I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this to shame you. He's saying, I'm saying this to shame you. <laughs> like, make no mistake about it, you need to understand this there. And he's talking about, he's instructing the church. Remember, this letter, we read it now. It was written to the church at Corinth, and they were going through a lot of stuff. They had a lot of issues they were dealing with at the time. And so he is trying to instruct them in some things. And he's saying, look at this. All of you in the church, you're believers, you all call upon the name of Jesus Christ, and you're having problems with each other, and you're going outside the church to try and resolve it with people who aren't believers. And this is a problem. He says you're bringing it to a secular court. Secular means anything other than church, basically. And he's saying you're going outside and doing this thing. He says, don't go outside the church. Don't do that at all. He's like, why can't you sell it right here? And so he's, he's actually telling us that we can judge some matters within the church. Okay? So we, we can judge some matters. Not saying go out and judge everybody for what they're doing, but he's saying you can actually judge some matters inside the church. It's been that way since Old Testament time, since Moses started standing up and judging the people and figuring out what was going on. I mean, we go through the whole book of Judges, and that's what the kings did, and the high priests, and all those things. It's not anything new, but he's saying it matters of dispute, conflict, etc. You guys can do this, but here's what you're supposed to do. Lift each other up and resolve things. You're not judging eternal consequences for people. So don't get scared about that. You can't say to somebody, because you've sinned to me, you are going to hell. You can't say that. What you can do is say, you did this wrong, we need to work this out. Or you can just walk away from it and say, you know what, I've been wronged, but I'm going to deal with that injustice. He's saying that we can judge on some things, but we don't judge on things of eternal consequences. And so there's a little bit there that's, that's important to understand that, well, you know, we are going to do a little bit of judging, but we shouldn't fear man's judgment because we're not going to be judging eternal consequences. But Paul gives some real strength to his, his discussion there because he says, don't you know that we're going to judge angels? And we're, we're a little ahead on the, on the PowerPoint, so if you get a little confused, we're just a little bit ahead here. But he says, don't you know that we're going to judge angels? And you might say to yourself, man, that's pretty crazy. We're going to judge angels? And he doesn't follow up and give us any other instruction on that. But there's a couple other tidbits we pull from other scriptures. I won't have these on the board, but there's an allusion to this in Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus says that all of the believers will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel with him. So there's a discussion about a judgment coming later on. And then there's a discussion that Peter has in 2 Peter chapter 2. And he says that even the angels that did wrong are sitting there awaiting judgment right now. So if you put those scriptures together, you get this powerful picture of people actually judging angels. And so people start to think, well, if we can judge the church and we're going to judge angels, then we have the ability to judge. And we start to fear people judging us, I think. And maybe there's a little something that, but it's not now and it's not this time. And so the second part of that sentence about not fearing man's judgment is this reason. It's limited. 
We don't want to get ahead of ourselves. You might say, oh, I'm going to judge angels. Yeah, good for you. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> don't worry about that right now. That's not important. And you shouldn't be walking around saying, I get to judge the church. No, no. If somebody comes to you or there's a matter that's brought before you and outside the church walls, no, we shouldn't be judging people there. It's, our, our judgment is limited to matters within the church for believers. But we get so f scared of judgment sometimes, what people are thinking, and what we're going to do and stuff, we start to give more power to what people's beliefs is on this. And, and it's a limited thing. Let me, let me put it this way. If we go back a couple chapters in Corinthians, Paul kind of explains a little bit about how this is a limited judgment that we could do. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. Say this. Now a person who is put in charge <clears throat> as a manager must be faithful. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. <laughs> my conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord Himself who will examine me and decide. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns. For He will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Then God will give to each other whatever praise is due. So Paul wrote that part before the part we read today, but basically saying, hey, there is a place for some judgment, but it's super limited. He's even telling the people, look, you guys can evaluate me. You can judge me if you want. doesn't matter to me. It's not important to me at all. Matter of fact, I don't even trust my own judgment in some of my issues. He says, my conscience is clear, but that doesn't mean anything because the one who judges is God. And so he's kind of putting everybody in their place saying, look, we don't need to be fear of man's judgment. He's not afraid of what the Corinthian church thinks of him. He is falling the Lord and doing what He's supposed to do, and He's not judging outside the church, and He's not just throwing out judgments haphazardly. So He's telling them, you know, don't, you don't need to be afraid of man's judgment. It's just this limited thing. God's judgment, on the other word, is something that we probably should fear. And there's nothing wrong with that. It even says in the Bible that, that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's okay to fear God, but to fear man and fear man's judgment, especially considering it's limited, I don't know. I don't know how, how you've been in that situation before. I don't know if you've ever been in the situation where you felt like you were judging someone and you've judged someone and you find out that you're completely wrong, that you had no idea whatsoever about this person. Or you say, have you ever had to say to somebody before, boy, I really judged you wrong? Well, that's a tough thing to say. It's a great thing to say to somebody if that's what you did. And the reason we judge people wrong sometimes is because we're not God. We're limited in our judgment. I love a verse we read out of Proverbs this week. In Proverbs chapter 21, verses 1 through 2, it says this. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. People may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their heart. See, we may have the ability to do some judging within the church, but it's limited. And we can't see inside like God has. So for us to have a fear of judgment, a fear of man's judgment, there's really no reason for it. It's just a limited thing, and so we shouldn't get caught up on that. So we shouldn't. So let's keep moving on with some, some other things we saw this week, because God can see what we can. This makes people fear Him in different ways that we don't need to, but sometimes we start to fear God in a, in a strange way. And I don't know if you've ever run this before, but we should not fear God's immediate judgment. And when I say immediate judgment, I'm talking snap decision making, you done wrong, you're dead. That type of thing, okay? Because sometimes I think that people really want to, uh, you know, get fearful of what God may do. And I, and I want to tread lightly here because I don't want to be for any moment saying that God can't do an immediate judgment on someone. God can do whatever He wants. But in our experience, immediate judgments are not very common. As a matter of fact, they're very uncommon. But for some of us, we live in fear that God is going to just get us if we mess up. If we mess up, God's going to get me. And that's going to be it. And, and I, I, have, I cannot tell you how many times I have invited someone to church and they've said to me, Oh, I don't know. If I walked in your church, I'd probably get hit by lightning. And they're like, ha, 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 you know, a good joke. And I'm like, I've heard it before. But, uh, you know, like, it's kind of mildly funny, but there's always some truth to that. When people say that, a lot of times they're fearful of walking in the house of the Lord, and that if they walk in and cr cross over the threshold into the Lord's house, that they will be struck down right then. I'm pretty sure God could strike them down right outside the front door, in the street, in their house, wherever the case may be. 
But I don't think that that's really what God's going for here. And I don't know exactly where this fear comes from in modern society unless people are really, really versed in the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, you see a lot of immediate judgments by God. New Testament, not so much. There was a verse we read this week, and I wonder if it's one of those things that, that strikes fear into people, strikes fear of this immediate judgment by God. It was in Psalm chapter 29, verse 3 through 9. Let's see if I can find it here. Excellent. The voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord splits the mighty cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon's mountains skip like a calf. He makes Mount Hermon leap like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with bolts of lightning. The voice of the Lord makes the barren wilderness quake. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists mighty oaks and strips the forest bare. In His temple, everyone shouts, Glory! And this passage is so full of some beautiful, powerful imagery. It doesn't say the fist of the Lord or even His little finger. <laughs> it says the voice of the Lord does what splits cedars. The mighty cedars of Lebanon. That's the wood that everybody went to because it was the strongest wood to build everything you built back in the time. That's where you went to get your wood. Twists, oaks, strikes with bolts of lightning, makes the wilderness quake, makes mountains move, the voice of the Lord. And so I think folks that are familiar with this passage say, well, if God can do all that by talking, then surely He's going to smash me into smithereens one of these days for one of my mess-ups. And I think that some of us start to get a little fearful just walking around ducking because <laughs> that's going to work, right? Just worried about like, here comes that immediate judgment. It's going to come any time now and I'm so scared of it. And it's like, well, there's that passage. And you know, you might remember a couple other stories in the Old Testament. One of them specifically leaps out to me and I don't have the verses on the board, but it's a story. It's in the book of Numbers in chapter 16. Three guys, Korath, Dathan, and Abiram. These guys stir up a rebellion against Moses. And God says, set them aside, I'll deal with them. And, and they do, and all the people, Moses tells all the people, stand back from those guys in their tents. And the, man, the men stand defiantly outside their tents with their families. And they pray, and the ground swallows them up, and they're never seen again, them and all their families. And when you hear a story like that, you kind of start going, you know, like, you know, <laughs> you start seeing the ground move when you get that kind of thing. Or, or here's a fun story for kids, by the way. Here's a good one. I'm going to have this one on the board. This is a fun story of Elisha. Elisha is a real hopping prophet. He had some exciting times in his day. This is in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses, uh, sorry, 2 Kings 2, verses 23 through 25. It says, Elisha left Jericho and went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, a group of boys from the town began mocking and making fun of him. Go away, Baldy, they chanted. Go away, Baldy. Elisha turned around and looked at them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of them. From there, Elisha went to Mount Carmel and finally returned to Samaria. And that's the end of the story. Some kids made fun of him for being bald. A couple of you out there can relate. And <laughs> he looks at them and curses them in the name of the Lord. And bears come out of the wood and maul children. And you're like, whoa, what is going on? here like that's some immediate judgment I'm pretty sure those mocking things they said were pretty terrible more than just go away baldy for him to, to curse them in the name of the Lord but it's like whoa so you read stories like these in the Bible true stories of things that happen to people that's why it's written down and passed on because everybody heard about it and knew about it they didn't mesh with Elijah after that are you kidding me you don't want bears to come out and maul you yes God did do all these things Yes, it was in the Old Testament. Flip to the New Testament. You rarely see an instant judgment on someone. It seems that for whatever reason, God has, I don't know if I want to say the term, changed His tone, but He seems to be giving out a little bit more grace and mercy for us. And, and I'll make this statement to finish off that one, that we should not fear God's immediate judgment, because it doesn't seem to be His goal. It doesn't seem to be God's goal. That's, that's the last fill in the blank is that it doesn't seem to be God's goal to do this. And, and I say that specifically, it doesn't seem to be His goal. I can't speak for God. 
That's why I say very clearly, it doesn't seem to be his goal. Because we just don't see that in the New Testament. We don't see that after Old Testament times. We just see that he seems to extend grace and mercy to us wherever we go. And so you might ask, well, what, what is God's goal then? If it's not for that immediate snap judgment, there's going to be a judgment at the end. Well, there was a couple of readings this week that I really think kind of shed light on why we don't need to fear that and what his goal really is. If we flip to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, as we read about Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall and how they were doing that, this is how Nehemiah starts out. The book of Nehemiah in chapter 1, verses 8 through 9 say this. It's a prayer from Nehemiah to God, and he's reminding God of what he said in the past. He says, Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, even, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. It's a fantastic, powerful prayer that Nehemiah is reminding God, You told us if we turned back to you that you would bring us back. That if we did bad, you told us that we would be sent out and scattered among the nations. And we're in that time right now. And God, we are turning back to you. Will you do this thing? And God does. Because I think that's his goal. I don't think he wants to just destroy us all. I don't think that's the desire of God's heart. I think he wants to bring us back to him when we turn to him. Return to God. How about this from this week? Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. A psalm of David, as he's crying out to God, he says this, Oh, what a joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what a joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your heavy hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All guilt is gone. That is a powerful, powerful prayer that David uh, puts out there. And it is incredible because... It shows what God's heart is. He wants us to turn and ask for forgiveness. And He wants to bring us back. And He wants to forgive us. It says that your sins will be gone, wiped away. The record is clear. And not only that, your guilt too. Sometimes we forget about that. We know that, you know, we've, we've been forgiven of our sins. But we still hold on to that guilt. We didn't give that up. We need to stop with that and give that up and realize that's gone too. That's what God's goal is, I think. That's why we don't need to fear God's immediate judgment. It doesn't seem to be His goal to just go around smiting people left and right. It seems to be His goal to getting people to turn back to Him and have that beautiful attorney that we've read so much about. I have a very close friend of mine who... He went through an amazing experience that brought him much, much closer than Jesus than he ever thought would be. And just to give you a short summary of his life, he began when he was a teenager walking with the Lord. And he grew up and he got married and he was in the church. And then he ran into some tough times with his wife. And they ended up getting divorced and, and they moved apart. And during that time, he really walked away from the Lord. He, he always believed in God, but he kind of discontinued the relationship or put it on hold if you want. And he had known that he had made a lot of bad decisions and a lot of sinful decisions. And so he really felt in his heart that God was just waiting to take him out. Those were his words. He said, I just knew God was just going to take me out, that he was just done with me because I had been close to him and I'd fallen so far away from him that it was just, it was over. I was just waiting for him to take me out. <clears throat> and he was a, a guide on a river rafting uh, company. And one day he went out with his friend and it was pretty severe rapids. I don't know what rating they were. I don't know much about river rapids. I don't, after hearing his story, I never want to get on him. But he is, so he's out one day and him and his friend, his, his boat overturns. He gets trapped underneath some water and he gets separated from his friend and he's all alone and he's pinned underneath a rock. And he said that uh, he remembers just saying, well, here it is. I knew he was coming to get me. <laughs> he, that was his last thought as he's blacking out in unconsciousness is that I knew this was going to happen. I knew God was going to get me. The next thing he remembers after that is about 15 minutes later. He's on a shore 
and a buddy of his is pounding on his chest and yelling and he's like coughing and stuff and he realizes he's alive and he looks up at his friend and he's like, what happened? And the guy tells him, we got separated and I don't know what happened to you. So I pulled over on the side and I got down on my knees and I prayed to God they would help me find you. And then you came floating up. And I pulled you aside and started giving you CPR and brought you back. See, my friend was dead wrong. God wasn't looking to get rid of him. He was looking to get him to turn back. And it was in that moment he realized that God didn't want him out of this earth or eternity or anything like that. God wanted him in a close relationship with him. And I thank God that he did because I love that man. He's my closest friend. And he turned back to God and that was what he needed. See, he needed to stop being fearful of this, this God's immediate snap judgment that we worry about sometimes. Maybe not everybody, but sometimes we think God's just going to strike me down. He's done with me. He's not going to put up with me anymore. It doesn't appear to be his goal. What his goal is, the thing that he wants so desperately, is that we would turn to him and repent of our sins and come back to him so that we can be together with him again. So we don't need to fear that judgment. We don't need to fear that immediate judgment. I, I will say this, fear God's ultimate judgment. I wouldn't put him on hold and ignore him. He does get the big thumb up or down at the end, right? But that immediate snap judgment that we seem to be grabbing some fearfulness from, from different passages we read about how God did some things in the Old Testament and how He's all powerful and we know He can, doesn't mean necessarily that He's going to. It doesn't seem to be His big goal. My friend's life was rescued because it wasn't God's goal to take him out. I think for those of us who called upon Jesus, we understand that it wasn't His goal to take us out either. And even if you're in one of those spots in life where you've been walking with Jesus for a long time or a short time, and you've run across some rough waters, and you think, man, he's not going to want to deal with me anymore because I keep turning my back on him. I do turn back around, but I seem to spend more time walking away than walking toward him. I don't think he's looking to just take you out. I think he's looking to bring you back in. Our fear of judgment should be rooted in truth. That's what we're talking about today is fear of judgment. That's a real thing, but it should be rooted in truth. We don't need to fear man's judgment, right? Because man's judgment is, is very limited. Can't touch us where it is most important. And we don't need to fear God's immediate judgment. This kind of concept of God just taking us out at a moment's notice. It doesn't appear to be God's goal. We need to live like that and share that with other people. For those of our friends or us that are walking around in fear of what other people will think or say or do about us, we need to say, I don't need to worry about them. I just need to set my eyes upon the one who died on that cross and was raised from the dead and not worry about what other people are thinking. And I don't need to worry about God thinking about taking me out any second if I, if I sin or if I fall off or whatever like that. I just need to set my eyes back on the one who died on that cross and was raised again for us. That's the kind of life we need to be living. Let's go out this week and share that with someone who maybe has never heard it before. Can I pray for you in your week this week and mine as well? Lord, I'm so thankful for this journey of going through the Bible and seeing Old and New Testament passages come together with different messages and stories. Lord, we know that you are the ultimate judge and there will be a judgment day. And Lord, I pray that we recognize that and recognize who you are and follow you. But will you give us the strength this week to not fear the judgment we don't need to worry about? The judgment of men around us and what they might think. We don't need to fear, Lord, you just striking us down in a moment's notice because you're really calling us back in relationship with you. Lord, will you help us to share the good news of you, Jesus, and what you did on that cross so long ago for each and every one of us because you wanted us to turn toward you. Lord, help us to remember the stories and the passages this week as we go about talking to people, loving on them, and loving you, God. Please be with us this week as we get to continue to share your word to this community. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. If you'd like to be at Twin Cities Rescue Mission on Wednesday, come see me. If not, hope to see you Thursday for the prayer time or the Bible study.